And welcome back, rugby fans, to Rugby 411. As always, I'm your host. My name is Joshua Shibata, and this is our MLR Week 4 Power Rankings for the 2024 season. Uh, it was, again, another exciting week of MLR Rugby action. Um, of course, there was a huge, huge win by two of our three new franchises, who got their very first victories in franchise history. Uh, we also had an amazing game of the week before between um, my power ranking number one and number two team, the Houston Sabercats and the Seattle Seawolves, which team ended up becoming the only undefeated team of the league. We'll find out in just a couple of moments. Um, again, if you've never seen my power ranks before, don't forget... These power rankings are not based off of purely win-loss records or who's on top in the conference rankings. It was It's really about what you do on the pitch, who you play against, where you're playing them, because we all know that home pitch advantage is a thing in Major League Rugby, as well as what have you been doing lately? Have you been winning? Have you been losing? Uh, as I always mention, a team that starts off hot at the beginning of the season may still have the best record in their, in their respective conference, but if they start to lose, they will slide down the power rankings. And it's quite possible that a team that may have a less, not as good a record as the other team may be above if they are on a winning streak. Also, it really depends on who you play against and who you're beating. There is going to be a great example of why a certain team doesn't move as high as another team. If you're pounding on the weakest team in the league, I'm not going to move you nearly as high as if you happen to beat the best teams in the league um, in their stadium. So a lot of things play a factor. It's not just who has the best overall record. Uh, these are power rankings. And man, there was quite a bit of a shakeup uh, this week in power rankings. And there were a few ones that uh, I had a little bit of a tough call. But let's begin. Probably the easiest call. Unfortunately... Um, the team that will probably be staying in the number 12 spot for the remainder of the season, the new boy, the new, one of the new kids on the block, Anthem Rugby Carolina. They are on the bottom still, number 12, still find, trying to find their first victory in franchise history. They played against one of the other new teams in this league uh, this year, the Miami Sharks, uh, in a game that was pretty lopsided, 50 to 21. Uh, Miami gets their first win of franchise history. Uh, I'll, obviously, I'll tell you where they go in just a couple of seconds. But, um, you know, I got to give a lot of kudos. Again, I've mentioned this before. If you don't know, Anthem Rugby is a developmental team, something that's not very familiar in American sports. It's a little bit more familiar in possibly European sports, especially in soccer. Um, it's composed of a, of a bunch of players that are purposely supposed to be young American eligible players, meaning that they're eligible to play for the USA national team sometime in the future, purposely between the ages of 19 and early 20s. So a very, very young team. There are some experienced international players on the team, but the purpose of this team is for the majority of them to be young American USA eligible players for the whole purpose that being on this team, they are able to start right away they if they were on any other team they would usually probably be on the bench maybe not even get a chance to play this season this is a, their opportunity to be starting players on a pro level a level that they've never played before against some pretty top talent both not only domestically here in the american in america but internationally because we do have a bunch of international experienced players so it really is a chance for these young players to get a lot of experience Obviously, that means they are pretty much at a disadvantage, so you will see a lot of lopsided losses for Anthem. But, as I was going to say, you do see the building blocks, too, was a very capable team. I mean, I got to shout out the, the fly out for Anthem Rugby, Oscar Collar. Great talent. Honestly, that kid has the potential to be a star fly half, good accuracy off of the tee, obviously doesn't get the kick as often because his team doesn't score. And then a person that does score for Anthem Rugby, and he was able to get us to try this game, uh, winger Josh Sheltner, I mean, this kid, 
is is phenomenal. Again, may not be a starter on any other team, but he does have the chance to shine. He's getting a lot of experience on this team. And again, this year definitely is going to be a wash. It's going to be a wash because you're having all these young kids. The majority of the team has never played professional rugby yet. So this is their first time. They're playing against a bunch of teams that have a lot more experience. But I guarantee you, in a couple of years, maybe not next year, but definitely I feel in year three, Anthem Rugby, if they keep the players that they have now, continue to build, will be a pretty competitive team. So nothing, you know, can't can't say enough uh, great things about Anthem Rugby. Not any disappointment that they're not going to win, but uh, no win for them. Miami does walk away with their first win in franchise history. We'll go a little bit more over the Miami win when we talk about Miami. The number 11 spot, um, a team that unfortunately has kind of uh, been in the bottom of the rankings in prior years, and they're back here again, the Dallas Jackals, who uh, unfortunately lost to Nola Gold, 35-22. to um, The game, not as competitive, I don't feel, as the score shows. There was a last second try in the game by Damian Torres that kind of made the, the score a little bit more even. But to be honest, uh, after kind of a hot start by Dallas, uh, Martin Elias has been a real, real clutch player for Dallas, especially after a very shaky, I think it was week two, that he was kind of inconsistent off of the tee. But, I mean, he's been money for Dallas. Had a drop kick goal right at the beginning of the game, and you got to watch out for Martin Elias because that's what Dallas did in order to win uh, to steal the win in week one against RFCLA, uh, Martin Elias was able to kick that drop kick goal. You gotta watch out for Martin Elias because right now I think he's two for two uh, in drop kick goals and he can score them from almost anywhere. That's an easy three points for them. Um, in this game, there are a lot of injuries. Uh, first of all, uh, Isaac Salmon, the prop for Nola. Uh, looked like he got his knee caught under him, and, and what would be kind of apropos, unfortunately, uh, if you pay attention to NFL football, American football, they just made a ban on the uh, drop hip tackle, uh, where basically it's to prevent injuries like what happened at Isaac Salmon, where your, your knee or your leg or your lower calf gets caught under the body when the tackle or is pulling the uh, tackle lead down. And unfortunately, that's what happened to Isaac Salmon. Uh, also in this game, Nola got a yellow card for Jared Adam, a red card for Jared Adams for an unsafe high tackle. Um, so Dallas for for uh, for Nola for quite a while was down to thirteen players, but despite that, Nola was still able to score um, a couple of times. Uh, Dallas did try to come back. Sam Gola had a beautiful uh, charge down kick block that he did that he able to scoop up to make a try. Um, but it, it was just not enough. It, by the time the second half rolled around, Nola was up 32-15. to 15, And um, despite that, though, uh, Nola really didn't score too much in the second half except for one penalty goal. Um, but again, uh, Dallas did score that last second try by Damien Torres, which made the score a little bit more presentable. But really, this game was all NOLA in Choctaw Stadium. So an impressive win by NOLA. Kind of disappointing loss for Dallas. So Dallas slides down um, a couple of spots down to number 11. The number 10 spot moving up a spot because of their win over Anthem Rugby is Miami Sharks, who, congratulations to you guys, Miami, for getting your first win in franchise history. Um, we do have to mention that Dallas, in their very first year, was not able to get a single win, so Miami was able to not have to repeat what Dallas did and got their first win, albeit against Anthem Rugby, a team that, you know, they should be. Uh, which is why, even though they slaughtered, technically, Anthem Rugby 50-21, to Miami only moves up one spot. And again, some people may go, well, wait a minute. They just slaughtered a team by 50 points. Um, they scored 50 on a, a team. Why can't they go up higher? Uh, yet yeah, it's the bottom-ranked team. New England dropped 60 on uh, Charlotte. It, it's not that impressive. No offense to Carolina Rugby. But uh, Miami should be putting those points. So they don't get to move that high up. But let's talk about Miami. Miami, again, looking like a really... Really great squad. 
Um, they a few impressive scores by Terry and White Tokia, a guy who used to be with Rugby ATL, which makes me a little upset because ATL moved over to LA. We could have had him on LA. He's been phenomenal for Miami. Uh, Miami got their four bonus try in just the first like ten minutes of the game. By halftime, it was thirty six to fourteen. Even though again, Carolina Rugby tried their best to kind of maintain some sort of momentum. It was really all Miami in this game. So again, a great win by Miami, beating on a lesser ranked team, so they didn't get to move up. But congratulations again for your first win in franchise history. Uh, the first one is always the hardest. If you can ask Dallas, they'll agree with that. Uh, moving on, dropping from number eight to number nine, round out the bottom four, is another newer team, the Chicago Hounds, who again can easily tell the new kids on the block the struggles of their first year. Uh, Chicago, unfortunately, losing, now granted again, losing to a really great team in New England, 17-22. to Again, the score may not be as reflective of how dominant New England was in this game. Chicago did do some really good stuff in this game. Unfortunately, uh, a sour note on it, Nate the Great Osberger looked like he suffered a really bad injury. Uh, they had to cart him away from the stadium, uh, from the pitch, ambulance took him away from the stadium. Fortunately, from what I understand by Chicago Twitter, uh, Nate is okay. He's okay. It's not as serious as it looked, but it looked pretty bad. He had to be carted away off of the field. Uh, going on, Chicago was doing really well, but New England's defense really brought it up, and they kind of kept New England, uh, they kind of kept Chicago out of the tri-zone area. Uh, New England was up 12-7 to in the by the halftime. In the second half, Chicago had multiple chime, times of scoring, but a lot of ball-handling errors in this game. Mark O'Keefe was able to, to almost score a try, but unfortunately at the last second, knocked the ball on in the try zone. So again, just a lot of weird handling errors. I mean, again, this has been something that's been kind of haunting Chicago from the start. It is week four. Granted, it's still a little early in the season, but you'd think some of these things would already be kind of shored up. But it, it was a sloppy second half. Uh, Damian Carlesi was able to score a penalty kick to get Chicago within five. But unfortunately, New England then scored a try right back. Uh, Jason Potros was the hero of this game for New England. We'll talk about more in that with when we talked about New England. But unfortunately, Chicago coming up short. They did get the bonus points, staying within seven in the loss. But a loss is a loss. And Chicago slides down one spot to number nine. Sliding down a spot to number eight. Old Glory DC, who, you know... Honestly, I was kind of feeling uh, Old Glory would do really well in this game against San Diego Legion. Uh, Old Glory defeating New England. They tied with Chicago in a very, very close game. Uh, now they're uh, hosting uh, a team that has to come all the way from the West Coast in San Diego to uh, Old Glory DC. One of the farthest trips in the league this season. But man... Uh, San Diego did not look like they were affected at all by the cross-country trip, and they ended up winning the game 27-11. to um, Old Glory looking a little lopsided in this game. Uh, Jason Robertson was doing his best to try to keep Old Glory in the game, hit a penalty kick, um, almost allowed uh, a try to score. By the half, uh, Old Glory was up 11-7, and then it was all San Diego. San Diego scores 20 unanswered points in the second half. Old Glory pretty much couldn't do anything. Um, so a very, very disappointing performance by Old Glory. I, again, I had them in my Super Brew. I thought they were going to win this game. And San Diego really proved me wrong in this one. So Old Glory slides down a spot from number 7 to number 8. Uh, moving up, the biggest mover up in this week... And some people may say it's biased, but, you know, there is a process to the madness. And I'll go a little bit more into detail later on. But sliding up four spots from number 11 to number 7, having their very first win in franchise history, Rugby Football Club LA. 
Congratulations, boys. I, of course, was at the game doing announcing. It was a historical moment for us. It was a very good game, but, you know, it kind of got scary near the end. RFCLA was hosting the Utah Warriors. Uh, were able to pull off the victory 36-32. to But, man, I mean, it, it was close. It was really close. Um, this is the first game that Utah actually scored first. It's the first game so far in four weeks that LA did not score first, which maybe might be something that LA needs to work and look into. But Utah ended up scoring first, and then LA ended up scoring Andrew Coe, who had two ga two tries in this game, a brace, uh, had a beautiful interception pass. He has been the star alongside Dan Holland's had the fly half for uh, LA. But man, Andrew Coe has been phenomenal so far. In this on this squad, he scored uh, an interception try, which kind of took LA into the into the momentum of the game. LA unfortunately still a lot of penalty issues, a yellow card in the game, but fortunately LA's defense has been really really phenomenal at least in the first half, keeping Utah out of the try zone, uh, seventeen and thirteen at the half. But then at the second half, LA scores back to back tries. Um, including uh, Andrew Coe's second try. But after that, it looked like, and, and LA was up 31-13 going into the second half of the, the, the fourth quarter, the second half of the second half. LA was up 31-13, but then all of a sudden Utah started scoring. They scored back-to-back -back tries, one by Phil Bradford, one by Mac Man Mike Manson. And to be honest, if it wasn't for the fact that usually the very steady kicking leg of Joel Hodgson uh, European star Joe Hodgson, who went three for six. He missed three uh, conversion kicks, and a, he missed two conversion kicks and a penalty kick, which that's seven points right there. Utah lost by four. I mean, we could have had a completely different game if Joe Hodgson was a little bit more accurate. Now, granted, it was very, very windy at, at the Dignity Hill Sports Park, but didn't really stop Dan Holland's head. Dan Holland's head was very good. Um, he only missed one kick out of the five kicks that he made. He only missed one. So Joe Hodgson was just a little off, but it was enough to allow LA to win the game. LA, speaking as a fan, definitely has to work on some disciplinary issues. But hey, honestly, like I mentioned before, LA has been super, super close in previous games, losing by one point to Dallas, losing by one point to San Diego in San Diego. LA has a very capable team. Got to work on the penalties, got to work on the yellow cards and the disciplinary issues, got to also work on that second half, having that momentum, because LA just seems to sputter out sometimes. But a good win against a very tough team. Um, I had to drop down Utah from who was number four at that time. So that's why LA goes up. So if you're wondering, why is LA going so high up? Is, is Josh just being a homer for his home team? Maybe. But... It, it, but why is LA gonna go up so high when Miami put over fifty, but put fifty points on Anthem Rugby and only went up a spot? Well, at the time, Utah was the four ranked team when LA, who was the eleventh ranked team, beat them. Okay, so a oh, eleven ranked team beat a four ranked team. Definitely, LA is gonna jump up. A ten ranked team beat a twelve ranked team. Not going to move as high, okay? So, I had Utah drop down four from four to six with that loss. Uh, it was debatable, you know, it, because it ended up being so close, I didn't have Utah drop past LA. I had LA still just a little bit behind Utah in the rankings. Um, Utah, again, put up a pretty good pretty good game. Joe Mono came back onto the squad, and he, he scored a try immediately in this game. So, Definitely something. Utah has been riddled by injuries, so it's good that, that they start to have a couple of their players come back. Uh, but yeah, LA was just a little bit too much offense at the beginning and held out long enough to keep Utah out of it. And again, Joe Hodgson being inconsistent off of the tee did make a huge difference in this game. But a very good game and a very good win for Utah. Uh, sliding up a spot from number six to number five your reigning and defending MLR champions, the New England Free Jacks, uh, defeated Chicago 22-17, as I mentioned before. Uh, big shout-out to Jason Patros. I mean, Jason Patros was pretty much the man in this game. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, New England scoring 22 points in this game. 15 of those points were by Jason Patros alone. Jason Patros was 3-4-4 uh, four, four off the tee, as well as scored two tries. Uh, he had a brace, so Jason Patros was definitely the man of the game. Again, New England pretty dominant in this game. Chicago was able to score at the very end of the game to get the game to get them a little bit closer on the score, but it was a pretty dominant performance by New England for the most part. Now, granted, New England did have some lineout issues. Um, they also had some um, handling issues as well. So you know, not a perfect game, but still a pretty pretty good win to allow them to move up at least a spot over Chicago. Now, your top four. Number four, a, a team that has really surprised me so far this season because I wasn't expecting too much for them. But moving up a spot, Nola Gold, who for at least the last couple of seasons has been pretty... It, 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 their consistency is the fact that they're inconsistent. Um, they'll usually win a good game and then they'll lose a bunch of games. So far, Nola, though, has been pretty strong. Um, only suffering one loss and having a very impressive win here against Dallas, 35-22. Uh, to 22. Now, again, uh, the one thing that I have to give Nola a lot of credit, and I did mention this guy, that he might make a difference, is Ed Fado has, has finally joined the squad on the pitch. It was his first start and his first time playing for Nola Gold, the former New York Ironworker. Former uh, top try scorer in the league, I believe it was a couple years ago. Uh, Ed Fidel was phenomenal. He scored a try in this game. He assists on another try in this game. He is definitely going to make a difference for Nola. And Nola looked a lot better with Ed Fidel on the squad. So Nola, again, was pretty dominant. Uh, as I mentioned before, they were up 32-15 to 15 at the half. Kind of tapered off in the second half. They only scored a penalty kick in the second half, but enough points ahead of Dallas uh, to make a pretty impressive win in Choctaw Stadium. So Nola Gold breaking the top four, um, kind of a surprise to me. I was expecting Nola to be one of the more dominant teams in the Eastern Conference. And then now, number three, this was a tough one. I had to keep San Diego, the San Diego Legion, at the number three spot. They did win a pretty good win, like I mentioned, travel, traveling across the country to go to Old Glory to beat them 27-11. But granted, Old Glory, you know, a seven-ranked team at the time, you know, I couldn't justify the win, as impressive as it was, to have them move into the top two, especially with the game that these two top two, these top two teams played. Easily so far the best game of the season. Now, granted... It's only four weeks, but it was a really, really fun game. Um, just as fun as the Old Glory New England game that was played as well. Uh, but San Diego, let's talk about them. As I mentioned before, unfortunately for San Diego, um, having to suffer the... Uh, having San Diego uh, doing as, as, as well as they did at the beginning... Um, kind of tapered out at the end against Old Glory. But again, San Diego doing pretty well in this game. They uh, ended the half 11-7. Uh, they were down and then started scoring a lot of points in the second half to pull away and make this, this game a pretty impressive victory. Again, 27-11 to over Old Glory. Old Glory, a team that I really felt had a lot of momentum going into this game. And San Diego just completely shut the door. So San Diego looking again like the threat that I thought that they're going to be at the beginning of the season. Uh, definitely it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out with them and the two top teams I'm going to talk about in the game of the week and possibly right now the game of the year. Seattle and Houston, the two at the time undefeated teams in the league faced off in an amazing, amazing game. And in the end... Houston pulls off the win, 42-40. to 40. So close, but because of that win, I moved Houston up from the number two spot to number one. And because it was such a close game, I only moved Seattle down from one to number two. Again, I couldn't justify moving San Diego in to the top number two spot. So we have the two teams. The only undefeated team left, Houston, uh, number one, Seattle number two. Let's talk about the game. First of all, Rickard Hattie unfortunately did get hurt in the last game that Seattle played, so he was not playing on the field. 
Uh, Houston scores a try at the very beginning. James Sigling. I mean, this guy's been pretty phenomenal so far this season. He scored his third try in three weeks um, from an assist by Mac Mason, who's also been pretty uh, great this season, but unfortunately did suffer a pretty bad injury in this game. Don't know what his status is. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, there was a high tackle yellow card by Inu Fudi, but later then Houston also got a yellow card. So there were some, some yellow cards going on. Uh, AJ Alatimu, I've got to talk about him as well been amazing in this game uh he keeps houston on top allows houston to lead 23 to 8 at the half um and then seattle though started coming right back they scored right at the beginning of the second half houston would score right back uh big joey telfuete uh who was playing for houston now playing for seattle scored a couple of tries scored two tries off of two malls Keeping Seattle in the game. Uh, Houston then scored on a penalty try because of Mac Mason, who unfortunately collapsed the mall. During that collapsing of the mall, though, it looked like Mac Mason got hurt. And because he got hurt, Sam Windsor, the top point scorer, top point scorer in the league in history, came onto the field. First thing that he did was he kicked a phenomenal 50 meter, which is almost 50 yards, penalty kick to get Seattle, to get, um, uh, to get Seattle within five, but in the end, Talahini Tassi uh, got was able to score a interception and a try to get Seattle back within seven. Um, but five minutes left, Houston gets a yellow card. Seattle was right on the doorstep. Seattle gets the score off of the yellow card because of Jay Stigling scoring his second try again. As I mentioned before, Jay Stigling was amazing in this game. That puts Seattle within two. Sam Windsor comes up to try to kick that conversion get, to kick to try to tie the score up. And unfortunately, he missed the conversion kick. Houston holds on to win. Uh, a very, very close game. Again, shout out to AJ Alatimu. AJ Alatimu was amazing in this game. 15 points, 6 for 7 off of the tee. Pure reason why Houston was able to stay in the game. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal game by both teams. My game of the week, of the season, and a well-deserved victory for Houston, who's looking really, really, really strong. Again, as I mentioned before, AJ Alatimu, formerly of Seattle, moving over to Houston. As I mentioned before, 15 points scored in this game, 5 for 6 off the tee. The main reason why Houston won, and he kind of got back. It, it was almost like a revenge game against Seattle, his old squad. Uh, what a win for Houston. And as I mentioned before, that AJ Alatimu could end up biting Seattle in the butt. And it did, especially in this game. Obviously, Houston and Seattle will play against each other again later on the season. We'll see how that showdown goes. We'll see where they are in the rankings and how their season is. But right now, your number one team... The only undefeated team in the league is the Houston Sabercats. Uh, as I mentioned, the Western Conference is going to be very, very competitive. You have the top three teams in my power ranking, all from the West. Um, I knew Seattle and San Diego would be the top two, but was not expecting Houston to make their name in this one. So definitely that top spot is going to be competed between these three teams. Um, it was a, a week for the, the Eastern Conference. No end up winning their game. New England won their game. So, uh, you know, yeah, we do have some Eastern presence in the top six. Uh, we'll see what happens between Utah and L.A. that are going to possibly fight for that final four playoff spots. Because remember, four teams from each conference get to go in. And then, uh, you know, kind of a familiar scene on the bottom four, especially between Dallas and Chicago. If you remember last season, those were the two teams struggling at the very bottom, and now Miami. Granted, they got their first win in franchise history, along with LA as well, uh, but they definitely will be struggling, possibly because they and Anthem are the two newer teams in the Eastern Conference, dealing with a lot of veteran teams. But... Those are the power rankings. Um, again, very happy with how this looks. As always, let me know what you think about my power rankings, where they are. Uh, let's now talk about something that I I honestly never really like talking about because I'm having a horrible year. If you want to talk about these guys having a horrible year, I'm having a horrible year. 
Let's talk about Super Brew MLR Rugby 411 pickups. Let's see the, the results of this week. And congratulations. I really hope I'm saying the name right. Sari, sorry. Uh, S A R R I E, number one golden cap of the week, uh, 7.08 points. Now, granted, James A6117 also has 7.08 points. Uh, James, I don't know how we've had ties before, I don't know how they determine who gets the golden cap in the end with this one, but Suri was the one that got it. But you came in a very, very close second. Uh, topping the top five. Uh, number three, Mr. Rugby with seven points. Number four, JZS with an impressive 6.25. And then we have a tie for fifth, Frisco Flame. My good buddy Frisco, able to really be impressive this year. It's almost like a flip-flop, Frisco, between you and me this season, because this season I've just been horrible. Uh, you have been very impressive. Six points, tying with Lady Juliet, another person who had a phenomenal week uh, after being kind of on the bottom with me i'm hoping that means that my week to be up on top is coming pretty soon um unfortunately the wooden spoon goes to a very good friend of the show usa league and union fan um union rugby fan i'm sorry brother got the wooden spoon with one i know you've been moping around the streets of la with a bag over your head but don't worry we have another week coming up and i'm sure you'll do well because there's only four games in this one so kind of hard to miss on next week's action. But we'll talk about that in the next video. Let's talk about where our rankings now overall stand. And we have a new number one because of being on top in this week. Congratulations to James A6117. You are on top of the, of the league right now. 30.33 points, but a very slim lead over our former number one, Tex, who drops down to number two, 29.91. Literally less than a quarter of a point or a fourth of a point um, between the two. And then because of her impressive performance this week, Sari, Sari, S-A-R-R-I-E, goes up two spots to number three, 27.58. Um, despite his impressive performance, JZS drops down a spot to number four, 27.33. And tied with him, Mr. Rugby, 27.33, goes up a spot to uh, tie for number five. Now... Let's talk about the bottom five. Unfortunately, Red Baron is uh, still sitting at number 26, 17.75. Sunshine uh, go, uh, drops a couple of spots to 17.50 to 27. 28, even though she had an impressive performance this week, moves up a spot. At least she moved up a spot. spot. Lady Juliet to 28, 17.50. Unfortunately, I moved down a spot to 29. Dogmai, 16.83. And then Leon, you're number 30. But you're still in it, 14 points. You're not that far behind me. So have a great week. Uh, and I don't have a good week. You could easily move out of the bottom spot. But those are our Super Brew Pick'ems. Uh, don't forget, guys, this coming week, we do have a game on Friday. So make sure you get those picks in. We only have four games, so not a lot of rugby action to pick from. And uh, I'll be honest, just a little preview of our upcoming video. I don't feel these are... I mean, who knows? There could be a bunch of upsets, but I think these games are pretty even, pretty easy to determine who will walk out on top. But again, I'll talk about that in the next video. Here are the power rankings again. Let me know in the comments below what you think about them. Do you think they're right? Do you think your team deserves to be on the top? Or do they deserve to be on the bottom? So let me know. And again, as always, I appreciate you guys watching my videos. And I'll see you on the pitch.